Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Uh, I'm so glad that you're all here and you can join me. Um, all right, let's get started. Our community is filled with diverse stories, and we recognize that our story begins with the indigenous peoples of this land. We acknowledge that we are recording uh, tonight's lecture series on lands that have been inhabited by indigenous peoples for millennia, and we would like to honor the centuries of indigenous peoples who walked on Turtle Island before us. Hi everybody, my name is Adrian. I'm the Visitor Services Coordinator here at the St. Catharines Museum and Welland Canal Center. Welcome to tonight's lecture. Next stop, the NSNT, our first in our new virtual museum lecture series that we'll present during uh, the, the museum's closure at this difficult time. We hope these lectures provide a bit of historical joy and also spark imagination and exploration into our city's rich history. Speaking of upcoming lectures, um, and I'm just going to uh, actually turn my camera off because you don't need to see my face <laughs> uh, from this, pretty much from this point on. So I will see you at the end, um, but I'm just going to turn my camera off. Um, so that you can actually see the full full screen uh, without the camera being in the way. All right. So speaking of upcoming lectures, we have um, we have some really great talks coming up on May twelfth. Our museum curator Kathleen Powell will be talking about the nineteen eighteen Spanish flu pandemic, an interesting topic in today's context for sure. On May 19th, I'll be back to talk about the first year of operation on the Welland Canal in 1830. It should be a really interesting uh, eye-opening experience. Uh, and on May 26th, our public programmer, Sarah Nixon, will be, will be on to talk about the city's rich Black history with her talk, Tracing the Tracks of the Underground Railroad. Thank you again to everyone joining us tonight. A, no uh, a note regarding the format and technology of tonight's program. By now, you'll notice that we've opted to broadcast our presentation to YouTube rather than host a Zoom meeting directly. This makes it a bit easier for everyone to enjoy the presentation without any hassle. However, it does make it a little bit more difficult to participate from the audience. So if you have any questions during the presentation, you can post them in the comments below or in the live chat box next to the screen um, uh, for this broadcast and we'll get them, we'll get to them at the end of the presentation um, or if I catch them in the middle, I'll try to address them there as well. I do have two screens so I can see what you say <laughs> and I can see the comments. So um, I hope that this format works well for everyone and we welcome any feedback if anyone has any difficulty. <clears throat> All right, let's hop on and begin our journey through the history of our local streetcar system. The history of our local streetcar or street railroad system is often overshadowed by the giant of our local history, the Welland Canal. So much study and effort has rightly been put towards the history of that vital link between the lakes that many other histories have yet to be told, or at least are sometimes forgotten. And I'm guilty of that as well. Transportation systems seemingly have an immeasurable impact on the development of our communities. If not simply for the geography of the matter of building blocks, digging channels, um, uh, installing iron tracks, and building stations or even building major highways, which soon alter the landscape, then certainly by the impression that they leave on our sense of place and sense of community. Yes, transportation systems, regardless of their mode, seem to provide the foundation for our sense of place. While the Welling Canal continues to define our local geography today and our sense of place today, Another important transportation system, the streetcar or street railway, 
is waiting patiently in the wings for a little attention. Please do not misunderstand. Much work and much research has been put to the history of the streetcar system in St. Catharines. It's just that almost as quickly as it was installed and developed, the system has disappeared from our local geography and certainly public memory, almost removing it from our sense of place today. With my talk this evening, I should make clear that I do not intend to present an A to Z history of the streetcar system in St. Catharines. In fact, <laughs> we won't even get to the end of the story of the streetcar network this evening. That's because we would be here until midnight or two in the morning, which some of you may not, not, may not mind, but at some point I'd like to go to sleep. <laughs> we'll save the second part of the story for another talk or for the many publications, Facebook groups, and additional information readily on, available online. So if you just can't wait for our next presentation on streetcars probably coming in June, that's okay. Go ahead and research. There's lots available out there. Instead of what I jokingly refer to as a master's degree, quote unquote, air quotes, in the NSNT tonight, I wanted to look at the way the NSNT story, <clears throat> excuse me, is told and perhaps look for some historical switchbacks, branches, and spurs that we could follow to unearth a further picture of the society that grew up along the NSNT. St. Catharines underwent, underwent dramatic change and growth after the second Welling Canal was completed in the 1840s. The new canal was far more reliable and a bit more purpose-built for supporting manufacturing, milling, and transportation than the first canal. It meant that more and more workers, even if mostly seasonal, were arriving in St. Catharines for work. Still, by the mid 1870s, when this uh, bird's eye view is from, the streetcar system would become, uh, when, when the streetcar system would become a reality, the community retained its rural profile and agricultural focus. With a population of approximately 8,000 people in 1871, St. Catharines was certainly the largest urban center in the area, though still far from a modern metropolis. Roads in and around St. Catharines were dirt, muddy in wet weather, dusty in dry weather, and always filled with the remnants of, shall we say, regular drives of livestock through the downtown. The addition of human, human waste was an unfortunate reality of urban living before indoor plumbing and major sewer systems. But it wasn't for lack of effort these conditions persisted. The municipal works struggled frequently against these conditions and until paving eventually made its way to St. Catherine streets, the lack of improved construction techniques left everyone at the mercy of muddy streets. Sidewalks were rare and centered on downtown streets like here on St. Paul, but always in high demand in the 1870s, Requests for wooden sidewalks as early as the 1860s are recorded, but it wasn't until the mid 1880s that more effort was put into planning a consistent sidewalk system. Again, pedestrians walked in the muck. Regular access across the canal was also a major problem throughout the region and impeded growth accordingly. With the lack of a good reliable bridge over the canal, growth in St. Catharines went north. In Meryton too, growth between the 1870s and the 1890s was concentrated on the east side of the canal, the same side as the factories, so that workers need not find a crossing to get to work. If these images conjure the opening scenes of basically every Victorian movie ever, uh, with hustle and bustle and shoppers and horses, uh, and lots of noise, that's about right. Horses and other animals, merchants and pedestrians filled the streets, supplying and buying up our goods and services, 
signs of a steady and growing local economy visible to all. What's missing, however, was consistent links between point A and point B for local passengers on a daily basis. What was it like getting around the city before an established network of roads, bridges, and even streetcars or other public transit? It was often hard and often involved a lot of walking, unless you owned a boat or a horse. So most people didn't leave their neighborhoods often, which I think at this point we can all relate to a little bit. In the 1860s, the rail network in Niagara began to grow quite dramatically, and folks could travel quite nicely in, around, and out of the region. The iron horse had arrived. The Welland Railway, built mostly parallel to the route of the Welland Canal, took on much passenger traffic in the region. It also connected with the Great Western Railway in St. Catharines in Western Hill and in Meryton for service to Toronto. Railways were popping up and becoming a popular mode of transportation. The building of railroads in Niagara is its own story, which, uh, which uh, I think we all agree deserves its own lecture at another time and after much more research. <laughs> Though it's important to note that their development and construction since the establishment of steam railways in the region, it only encouraged, encouraged, if not fostered, the local street railways and eventually interurban service to take root. With an established rail network, the progression towards street railways or streetcars seems natural. By the mid 1890s, most urban areas in Ontario, like London, Hamilton, Toronto, Ottawa, and St. Catharines had electric streetcars. But the system in St. Catharines was significant because it was developed a bit earlier than the others. The first streetcars of the new St. Catharines Street Railway Company appeared in earnest in 1879. They were drawn by two horses and had steel wheels which ran on L-shaped rails over the muddy streets we're already familiar with. The cars could carry 12 passengers and operated from the Welland House Hotel, which was also a stagecoach depot on Ontario Street, along St. Paul Street and Queenston Streets to Hennessy's Corners, uh, which is most simply put the eastern reaches of today as Centennial Park at Oakdale Avenue, then called Thorold Road. You really need a map to figure that out. I'll give you a second to look at it. It was pretty basic downtown system, mostly used by folks who had offices downtown, but lived just outside the main urban area. Service was regular, but was only every 40 minutes between 5.50 a.m. and 11 p.m. We'll come back to the map just in case anybody really wants to look at it some more. While the service was mainly used by locals for getting around, the service did connect to the Welland Railway at Meryton Station on Oakdale, and so also connected to the Great Western. So for your long journey out of Niagara, the streetcar thankfully got you to the train station rather than you having to hire a hack or a cab, uh, which could be quite expensive. This made traveling for work really simple for most men who may have moved frequently for work at different locations around their region, seasonally or otherwise. Horses were a regular part of life in St. Catherine Streets, as we sort of talked about a little bit already, and were absolutely the main source of transportation power on the Welland Canal, as steam was present but hadn't quite taken over just yet. The presence of horses pulling the streetcars wouldn't have shocked anyone, and for the horses, it was just another thing to pull. Wagon, carriage, boat, or streetcar, it made no difference to most of them. Horses were an important part of downtown life. They populated the streets and the market square, but also made daily visits to the home, uh, to the homes, to homes around the city for deliveries. There were dozens of stables or liveries in the downtown core, taking up quite a bit of space, 
solidifying the importance and the normalcy of the horse in the urban environment. And I'll just take a second to draw your attention to some liveries on Summer Street, just off James, right there. Unfortunately, the pictorial history of the streetcar horses in St. Catharines isn't as well documented. There's lots of pictures of the streetcars themselves, um, but there, I wasn't able to find, there may be the, some out there, but I wasn't able to find as many uh, photos with the horse attached. So here's a photo from Hamilton showing a very similar streetcar to the ones that we have uh, with a typical quarter horse pulling the car. Idiot. Now, the big shock <laughs> would have come with the electrification of the system in 1887. Can you imagine your whole life only having a visible, tangible power source out in front of a wagon? And then all of a sudden, uh, the same wagon is seemingly traveling on its own. Now, I doubt anyone mistook the electrification for witchcraft. After all, the St. Catharines Electric Light and Power Company was incorporated in 1884 and set up shop at Lock 5 on the Second Canal, now underneath Westchester Avenue near Oakdale Avenue. Between 1884 and 1900, they installed 3,000 electric light bulbs through the streets of St. Catharines. Electricity appeared in industry and in residential areas as well at this time. James McSloy, the propri proprietor of the Canada Haircloth Company with his brother, is reported to be the first to have electric lights in his home after he ran lines from the factory to his home on Church Street in uh, 1887. Around the same time, a generating station was also set up at Lock 3 to power industry in the Canal Valley, since electric uh, power is far reliable to steam. The power generating station set up, at, set up to power the electric streetcars was specifically set up in the middle of the streetcar line between St. Catharines and Meryton and Thorold uh, in 1887 at Lock 12 on the Second Canal, which was located just south of the Great Western Line, now the CN Line, um, where it crosses. So you can see that I'll, this is an aerial photo from 1921, so I'll just annotate. So you can see there's the railway there. Um, and then here is the power generating station at block 12. <laughs> I love my annotations for anyone who's seen my virtual uh, lectures before. <laughs> but unfortunately, in Zoom, you have to undo them or they stay there forever. So I'm just going to undo them now and move on. The electric street railway, which had really only been attempted a year earlier in Montgomery, Alabama, was really the first successful electric streetcar system in Canada. This incredibly significant achievement was only possible because of the hurried advancement to electrification of canal industries in the early 1880s, as the second canal was slowly phased out in the favor of the third new canal. The second canal was to have a second life as a major power generation source, a role that the remnants of the waterway still maintain today. It was a perfect start and the horses luckily weren't uh, wholly unemployed uh, instantly. For two weeks every year, the canal was emptied for maintenance and the horses were harnessed back up to keep service going. The climb from the bottom of Westchester Avenue to the top of the hill at Queenston was also somewhat difficult for the new electric cars that didn't have enough power. So a backup team was actually kept at the ready to make sure the cars made it up the hill. In comparison to major cities around North America, St. Catharines led the way with electrification and development of its streetcar uh, network. 
New York City, though, for example, was still operating uh, a large majority of its streetcars by horse in 1895, though their transportation system took a dramatic and deep dive underground in the developing of the subways. So uh, it's not really a truly fair comparison. The Vanderpool system was used to electrify the streetcar network involving double overhead wires carrying a heavy four-wheeled traveler connected, connected to the car by a flexible cable. When the traveler dewired, which was often, the conductor restored it with an implement described as a refined hay fork. Fan wires were used where the line was laid in the center of the road with bracket arms on roadside sections in Meriton and Thorold. Standard wire height was 19 feet and all insulators were of wood. Where poles weren't available or needed, wires were leapfrogged on buildings. Once it was open, the street railway drew attention from the US magazine, uh, US electrical magazine called Electrical World, which praised the new system. Quote, the electrical, the electrical railway system at St. Catharines, Ontario is now working so successfully on the Vanderpool system. The line is 116 yards short of, of uh, six miles in length. It is, one of, it is one succession of grades and curves. And one of the heaviest grades is on a curve. There are a number of grades six feet in the hundred and uh, one, of, one of 400 feet in length, seven feet in hundred. In fact, the whole six miles, there's only one straight run of 1,500 feet on the level. The company has at present five motor cars, 15 horsepower each. It is equipping a car every two weeks and intends by the 1st of May to have 12 motor cars running. The road was very hard on horses on account of the grades, and as company as the company gets its water power from the Welland Canal at a nominal figure, the saving of the change to electric motors is greater than it would be to use steam to generate the current. The secretary of the road has calculated that the company saves by by the change, after deducting interest on the electric plant, about eighteen dollars per day. But this is not all. As the company is able to give the public cleaner cars and more rapid transit, the passenger business has increased by about 35%. The motors are placed on the platform of the horse cars and the drivers had had no difficulty in learning how to handle the machines. The company has had not a single mishap of any consequence to its electrical machinery. And though the municipal authorities were very slow to give it permission to adapt, uh, to adopt electricity, they approve of the change. The drivers and conductors seem to have more respect for themselves than they did in the horse cars. They are more polite to passengers. In fact, aside from the business of saving uh, and savings to the company in operating expenses, the company says they would not have the care and trouble of a stable full of horses on any account. It is found that five electric cars do as much work as eight horses, or sorry, eight horse cars. End quote. There were some tricks to the Vanderpool system because uh, of the original design. The motorman who sat in the middle could not operate the handbrakes at the end of the car. That's part of the trouble of refitting horse cars to electricity. The weight of the motor was significant and would sag so that parts didn't align properly. The entire system was troublesome, and in 1896, the system was scrapped in favor of the Sprague system. Uh, with its spring-loaded pole and trolley wheel riding under the water, something that we're all pretty familiar with today. By 1900, experimentation and working out the kinks in the streetcar network had seemingly completed. Light signals were installed along with huge track replacement scheme in 1896. New cars with General Electric engines were introduced. The system was coming in to its own. One thing we haven't quite spoken about yet is the uh, wide field of ownership of all of these private lines. The construction of the network up to the turn of the century was really taken on by several private companies 
And from a historian's point of view, or at least my point of view, uh, seemingly updating their names and changing ownership as frequently as they would change dance partners. Uh, it can be very confusing with all the names. The St. Catherine Street Railway, Railway, whom we've already met, was the first but then in 1882 was sold and reorganized into the St. Catharines, Meriton, and Thorold Street Railway. It was sold again, this time to US businessmen and renamed again in 1896 with a name more descriptive to the north-south route that had been expanded. This one is now the Port Dalhousie, St. Catharines, and Thorold Electric Street Railway, which acronyms to PTDSTC, and T E S T R Y Co L T D. <laughs> Say that five times fast, not very catchy. There's a picture of, the, uh, of that acronym <laughs> up there. <laughs> Between being purchased, reorganized, and sold, these companies expanded trackage quite significantly and more reliably linked Port Dalhousie with Thorold through St. Catherine. A line out through the fields of Queenston Street was built to reach Victoria Lawn Cemetery as well. Permission was given to these companies to build such important infrastructure by municipalities. So in a time when urban planning was just beginning and just becoming a, an established profession, the many companies and different municipal councils expanded the system quite dramatically over a 10 year period. Eventually, municipalities became major bondholders since expansion plans became larger and larger and sometimes involved competing with the traditional railroads. All this buying, building, reorganizing, and reselling came to the eventual incorporation of the Niagara St. Catharines and Toronto Railway Company in 1899. It was to take over the property of the St. Catharines and Niagara Central Railway. The majority shareholders were American at first, which did infuse cash into the system, but after a uh, short recession in 1902, it was taken over by Sir William Mackenzie and Sir Donald Mann of Canadian Northern. By 1903, NSNT had completed the basic network in St. Catharines and staged major expansions over the next years. The expansion included more cars, lines, and, uh, and a major downtown St. Catharines station on St. Paul Street, right next to where the Performing Arts Center is today, if not even where the film house is located today, and the uh, recital hall, that part of uh, where the box office is basically of the Performing Arts Center. Like any big and bustling city, however, congestion became a major problem especially as more and more cars, oops, more and more cars filled the streets. Moving a streetcar and vehicles through the narrow curves of St. Paul Street became a nightmare. In the 1920s, after Canadian National took over the operation of the system through its Canadian National Electric Railway, a new hub and station was built out on Welland Avenue. Tourism exploded in the Edwardian period, a decent economy excluding a slight recession in 1902, and re reliable forms of transportation, including the NSNT, meant more folks were day tripping to Niagara Falls, beaches, and festivals around the Great Lakes. This is tourism really in its earliest form. Picture parasols and boater hats. Uh, picture steam trains and steamboats and streetcars packed with day trippers looking for an adventure. There's our boater hats. <laughs> Looks like so much fun. Well, early steamship passenger service between Toronto and Port Dalhousie had begun in 1884, it wasn't until the NSNT under the leadership of Mackenzie and Mann that an integrated system of street railway and steamships was organized. Previously, ship companies competed with each other and with railways and drove each other out of business through fair rate wars. 
At the turn of the century, the NSNT, with cash to spare, as it seems, swept in and stabilized services with the Niagara, St. Catharines, and Toronto Navigation Company operating the, uh, the Garden City and the Lakeside. Later on, the Dalhousie City was added to the roster and became an icon for recreation on the Great Lakes. Lakeside Park at Port Dalhousie was developed by the company around 1902 and became an incredibly important source of traffic for both steamers and electric cars, particularly for organized groups, including the annual Emancipation Day picnic celebrating the, uh, uh, the abol abolition of slavery across the British Empire back in 1833. In 1903, the park welcomed over 200,000 visitors, most of whom were carried through on NSNT services. The company built an amusement park with concessions and picnic areas and amusement rides. And of course, the Lakeside Park Carousel the last of these rides around today was relocated to the park in 1920, 1921 to sit alongside 58 other attractions and welcome over 500,000 visitors a season. The important role the NSNT played in developing tourism across the region, including getting visitors from Toronto and Buffalo to Niagara Falls, Crystal Beach, and of course, to Lakeside Park, cannot be overstated. The company moved transit beyond moving people from point A to point B. They made their brand something of a travel brand we might recognize today and fostered traveling on their lines as an experience, not just a mode of transportation. Mackenzie and Mann knew their game and they marketed their way through the first tourism boom of the 20th century. The best images and memories come out of the tourism days of the NSNT. Images of shocks, ships and docks uh, swarmed with tourists, postcard photos of streetcars running through clean paved streets of the busy St. Catharines, Meriton, and Thorold neighborhoods. The marketing of the NSNT to tourism, and not just local folks, is the reason that many, per many people refer to the streetcar network as the NSNT, even though the, uh, the network had many different owners, uh, was run by many different companies, and has seen many different changes through the system uh, before the First World War and after. The NSNT and immediately following the First World War, the Canadian National Electric Railway Company operated in the background of the city's life, sometimes unnoticed. But the importance of the NSNT in our collective memory and sense of place is matched by only the canal. Its power in our story is such that it still makes an impact today, despite its almost complete erasure from our landscape. Where the canal developed over more than a hundred year period, the streetcar network in St. Catherine solidified its place in our starts in our story in far less than half that time. The end of the NSNT and the CNER network in Niagara is entirely the fault of the automobile. Boom, boom, boom. Indeed, what can't be blamed on the automobile? In a time when municipalities are desperate for money and infrastructure for interurban transit links, including the reestablishment of Go Light Rail service in Niagara, this ebb and flow and the cyclical nature of uh, our history is so interesting. The stories of the early streetcar network, if we ever managed to get a fraction of that kind of service back, could not only solve traffic issues around the region, but foster local tourism just as the NSNT did over 100 years ago. While the, while the streetcars no longer run and the steamships have long since left port, 
The memories and stories of the NSNT and the streetcar network continue to foster a sense of place in our community. Thank you very much for attending tonight's lecture. If you have any questions about tonight's presentation, you can post them in the comments in the YouTube broadcast below. Because there's a bit of a uh, delay, oops, because there's a bit of a delay, I'll just talk about a couple of things um, while anybody wants to put their questions in the comments. So while I give you a few minutes to post your questions, I'd like to take a moment to remind everyone to please give us a like and please share um, all of our uh, awesome posts and social media on our channels. Um, this helps you to stay in the loop, but also your friends to stay in the loop. And uh, it's great to have uh, such supportive people supporting our virtual programming during the museum's closure. Please also share the museum in your own social networks to help more of our community join in the historical adventures. So just a reminder, facebook.com slash St. Catherine's Museum, which I think most of you are following. Um, make sure you actually like us because uh, sometimes you might, you might see our stuff, but you might not actually like us. So do give us a like, that helps out a little bit. We're also on Twitter and Instagram at SDC Museum. So if you're on those platforms, you can give us a follow there. And of course, um, our museum, all of our museum information is living at St. Catherine's Museum blog.com, where we have tons of activities, lesson plans, uh, blogs, and lots of information for folks who uh, want to check it out that way. Additionally, we also have two podcasts. If you love the deep dive nature of a lecture series, why not also try our podcasts? We have two, Museum Chat Live and One Hour in the Past. You can catch our podcasts on iTunes, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. Additionally, we hope to announce our June lecture schedule in the coming weeks. We'd love to hear from you about what topics you'd like us to, uh, would you like us to see um, to see us tackle. So please send us a message or leave us a comment to share your ideas. 